Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Glad that you could join us today. I am Amanda Hickel. I'm the Director of Development and Communications for Lancaster Farmland Trust. Um, and we are glad that you could join us. It's a gorgeous day outside. It's beautiful. Uh, blue skies, not a cloud in the sky, at least where I am. I hope the weather is the same way for you where you are. Um, and we're glad that you could join us today for our sixth webinar in our series of webinars that we're putting out there. Hopefully you're learning a lot from them. We're glad that you've been engaged. We've got a, a big crowd today. We've got about 45 people on the call, which is awesome. Um, and we're hoping that this provides you with an opportunity to learn a, a little bit more about the work that we do, our mission of farmland preservation, um, and hopefully allow you a chance to escape the four walls of your home um, and put your boots on the ground out in the field with trust staff and one of our preserved farm owners um, today. So glad you could join us. Um, I know we have a diverse group of folks on the call. We've got a lot of folks um, that live right here in Lancaster County, but uh, looking down through the list of those in attendance, I know we have uh, somebody from New Jersey. We have uh, a supporter from Miami, Florida. Um, we have somebody down in Virginia. So welcome to everybody. Um, and glad that we can give you a little taste of Lancaster County today, even if you're not here right here in Lancaster County. Um, we, uh, Lancaster Farmland Trust has preserved 513 farms and uh, more than 31,000 acres, actually 31,131 acres to be exact. Um, so we, um, we also have 50 farms on our waiting list um, and are currently working on 20 different projects this year. And so we've got a lot going on and uh, today wanted to give you um, just a a tour um, and a, a, uh, a chat with one of the owners of our one of our preserved farms. His name is Mel Nisley. Um, and what we're going to do is join our chief operating officer, Jeff Swinehart, out in the field. Hopefully you can see him out there already. Um, and uh, with Mel, who uh, they're going to talk a little bit about Mel's uh, farming operation and, and ask him a few questions. You'll also have some some uh, an opportunity later in the webinar to ask questions as well. So um, feel free to wait for that time if you want to pose a question or we do have a chat um, option on this. So if you have a question that you want to pose there, feel free to put that in the chat and we'll, um, we'll bring that up with Jeff and Mel a little bit later in the program. You'll also hear today from our Director of Land Protection, Jeb Musser, who's going to uh, give you a little bit more information about Mel's farm, show you some maps of the property um, and kind of round out the discussion there. So. Just a few housekeeping issues. Um, all of you are going to be muted during this presentation, but if you'd like to unmute yourself at the end for Q&A, you can feel free to do that, to ask a question. Um, again, there's the chat option um, if you wanna pose a question. Um, and we are happy to have you here. So welcome, and I am now going to throw it over to Jeff Swinehart, our Chief Operating Officer. Jeff? Well, hello everyone. Uh, we're glad that you could join us. It, it is a beautiful day. Uh, I know I am certainly thankful to be able to be out on a farm and not cooped up in my house. Uh, and we're very thankful that Mel Nisley uh, agreed to allow us to come out here. As you can see, we're, we're trying to be sensitive to the COVID-19 issue um, with our masks on. Uh, Mel has indicated he would prefer not to wear a mask. So we're keeping our social distancing. I'm actually gonna stand behind the camera, you know, more than six feet away while we ask these questions. But uh, it's great to be here on Melmar Acres, which is the name of the farm. Uh, you'll hear more about it. Uh, Mel and his wife uh, um, preserved the farm back a number of years ago. They've actually preserved uh, four farms with the trust uh, at this point. So we're really thankful for the opportunity to be out here. Um, you're gonna hear some noise in the background. We're on a working farm. We have some heifers behind us and they like to talk a little bit uh, when we start moving around some. So we're gonna ask a few questions of Mel about the operation and then we're probably gonna pause uh, and we're gonna move to a different spot just to give you a different vantage point of the farm at which time Jeb uh, will, will give some overview with some maps of the farm that, that we have at the office there. Uh, so with that, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Mel Nisley, the uh, owner and operator of Melmar Acres. Hi, Mel. Good morning. How are you this morning? Uh, we're doing great. It's a busy time, but we're enjoying the beautiful weather that's here before us. Thanking the Lord. That's right. That's right. 
So Mel, uh, tell us a little bit about your farm. You know, what do you grow or raise and uh, how long have you owned and managed the farm? Yes, that's a loaded question. Uh, we bought this particular farm in 1986, uh, which is when we would have begun what I call real farming, uh, where you till the ground. Prior to that, I was involved in a poultry operation, a laying operation, which I still am. But this particular farm that we're on today, the home farm, we purchased in 1986. Uh, we have a herd of cows here, approximately 200 milking with young stock. And then uh, we still have the laying operation on another farm with about 190,000 laying hens. And then as far as crops, um, mostly what we raise is corn and alfalfa, but we also raise some soybeans, some wheat, and we double crop rye and triticale. Uh, I think that covers uh, most of the question. Great, great. So it, it certainly keeps you busy. Without a doubt, in this time of the year with the delayed uh, planning season, uh, it, it definitely has, uh, there's days that are busier than others. <laughs> <laughs> so give us a little insight of your family's history and connection to agriculture. Yes, I grew up in a farm. It was a poultry farm next door where my younger brother lives. I um, always had an interest in farming, but it was very, uh, uh, just like nowadays, a very high uh, investment to get into farming and so I did electrical work for 10 years and uh, and then got out and through that that 10 year period and I these farms came for sale next door to the home farm and that's kind of how I got back into farming uh, along with the poultry operation which I really started with that before I even started the electrical business so uh, a little different than some uh, paths maybe to get into farming but I grew up in a farm and they say you can take the boy off the farm but you can't take the farm out of the boy and I knew I didn't want to do electrical work all my life, but it was a good tool to get involved in the farm with less debt load. Sure, absolutely. And some of your children are engaged in the operation here, is that correct? Yes, three of our four children are involved uh, on the farm. Uh, the oldest son here purchased the cows probably about 12 or 13 years ago. And so he and his wife and family of five children operate the dairy end of the business. Uh, my younger son, Jeremy, uh, uh, works with the custom farming. We do custom planting, custom harvesting, and he actually owns a combine and does a harvesting end of the business. And then we have a daughter and son-in-law that are involved in the poultry operation, and they're involved in ownership there. So while dad still owns all the real estate, each of the children that are involved in the farm have some type of segment that's their own business. That's great. That's great. And I bet it's 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 nice to have kids close to home and involved in the family operation. Yes, it is. It certainly brings challenges, but it brings lots of rewards too. And so I'd say the rewards are better than the challenges. And uh, we do uh, appreciate that we don't have a partnership. We we each operate kind of independently, but still work together. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> so how do the products that you grow or raise on the farm? How do they leave? Where do they go to get processed? Yeah, most uh, of what's grown here in the home farm is used for the cows, forages, uh, corn, etc. cetera. Um, we do a fair amount of custom harvesting, and so we have a lot more grain than what we use on this operation. We also store grain and then sell throughout the year. So um, we deliver grain throughout the year to various feed mills and also wheat and soybeans. And as far as milk, it's picked up by a local co-op. As far as the eggs, uh, my youngest son purchased a tractor trailer back, uh, I guess it was in 06 or 07, and he hauls all the eggs from not only our operation, but also my brother's operation to the processing place. So we sell our eggs as Nest Run, and he's involved with the trucking and also his own business. That's great. That's great. Uh, so what's the most common question people ask you or comment that people make when they find out that you are a farmer well i'm not sure if i have an answer on that one uh we socialize a lot with farmers so it's not uh that unusual if i get into a setting which i do occasionally at men's breakfast and so forth people are very um uh, uh very curious about the farm. In fact, probably two or three years ago, uh, a group came down to look at the poultry operation and we're very uh, very careful about how often we do that, which is very few times, 
we'd much sooner do tours on the farm on the dairy farm here than in the poultry farm just because of disease and those type of sure. things that you can carry into a chicken house pretty quick um so yeah it's uh, uh i get i get a lot of you know interesting questions and they think that this is a big farm but in reality uh it's really a small family farm in today's terms and we like it that way yeah. So now, can you highlight some of those biosecurity precautions that you put in place, especially related to the poultry side of the operation? Yeah, as far as the poultry end, we have signs out around the building's perimeter, and we also have uh, the doors are locked when no one's there. Uh, we have a, a disinfect mat out front. Uh, we we have very few visitors coming in uh, outside of uh, perhaps a serviceman once a month. So we have, other than employees, we have very little outside traffic coming in. So we do feel like uh, not only our location, but also the amount of people that would be coming to the operation is very small. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, we've been blessed a number of times between avian flu back in the 80s and also Coriza here just recently. Uh, so far, we've continued to be thankful that we haven't uh, had any of that, those challenges on the farm, on the poultry farm. Yeah, that's, that's, so, yeah. that's great. I know for some farmers, um, the impact of avian flu and, you know, most recently, you know, the disease certainly had some pretty detrimental impacts to their operation. So uh, I can certainly understand that you're thankful you didn't have to, you didn't have to go through that sort of uh, uh, implication to the operation. You know, the challenges now uh, have more to do with COVID-19 uh, with the market for our eggs, um, the contractor that we've been with for 30 years has uh, has had a real reduction in the amount of eggs they needed. So we've had to do some steps to reduce our production, and we're still in the midst of that. And I I tell my son-in-law that it's day to day, and so far it's been uh, turning out okay. But we do have some we have more anxious moments over the last uh, six weeks and what we've had probably in the previous 30 years over where and how our eggs will get marketed efficiently and uh, productively. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And have you felt any impacts related to COVID-19 on the dairy side of the operation? That's a good question. Uh, I was thinking of telling my uh, son and daughter-in-law about this tour. Um, they could speak more from the dairy end because they do the day-to-day -day cow care with their employees. And I think probably uh, just the exposure from employees is probably would probably be their biggest concern. Um, outside of that, there's limited traffic too coming through the dairy. So where I see, uh, where I am more aware of it is when I take corn to the grain, uh, you know, to a feed mill or uh, do something where I go pick up chemicals for the farm or something. Uh, that's when I think about it more, wearing a mask in, in among, um, you know, uh, the elevator and wherever I take things to. So around the farm, while we're certainly more than aware of it because of all the news, et cetera, it doesn't impact our day-to-day -day work significantly. Got it. You know. And so tell us um, what's happening on the farm today, this week. Um, take us through a day in your life. What's that consist of? Yeah, that's. Um, I know uh, it's that, really. Yeah. I know it's really busy <laughs> yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah, and and you can't tell that from standing here, but if you go out in the in the yard, you can see all the equipment sitting out that we're using. Yes, that changes obviously from day to day based upon what needs done in the weather. The weather is the biggest impact, and we've had a lot of rainy weather this spring that has delayed various activities, especially planting. But here on this farm, spring activities were. We chop rye, treated a cow on alfalfa hay. Today, the alfalfa hay was laying since Monday, and we're going to chop the, the balance of about 60 acres yet uh, shortly after this interview is over. And uh, my youngest son is out planting corn, and that pretty much spreads this as thin as the labor that we have because we have no other than my oldest son and my youngest son and myself. That's really the only labor we have here on the crop end of the operation. Uh, we do have a labor down at the poultry operation and labor for milking. But when it comes to actual crop work, it's basically my two sons and myself. And so, uh, and plus the equipment we have is limited to all our tractors will be in use today so that I had a neighbor that wanted to borrow one to rake and I said, we won't have one available today. So, so it's, uh, and then, yeah, so we're corn planting and we like to soybean plant as soon as we can get uh, 
what we feel like enough of the corn on the high ground planted so that and the, until the ground dries out a little bit it's still not too dry but yeah we're we're making progress and and thankful for um the good days the, the good sunny days we got and and uh and uh but it's it's certainly busy this time of the year yeah absolutely so is this spring uh, a typical spring for you or is things delayed a little bit we've had a, a fair amount of rain yeah i would uh, say this is delayed uh normally i like to start putting corn in a anytime oh. after the 20th of april and i think this year the first we put in the ground was definitely may i'm gonna say may 6th or may 7th without looking back maybe may 5th um and so yes the planning's delayed but we also got the ryan triticale in ahead of time quite often that's competing with planting corn so uh, it seems like it's all working out I, I my ideal conditions and obviously we're working with the weather is that you can get a nice window to get things done it doesn't all come in a pile uh, the, the expression goes, you have to make hay when the sun shines, and that's so true. And then, unfortunately, if if those uh, windows are scattered, then a lot of work comes in a pile. And so it's nice if we could spread it out eight to five every day. But last night I was out in the tractor inverting hay at a quarter of ten and got up this morning to take a load of corn at a quarter of five. So uh, at 62 years old, I just as soon quit. I often say when the lights come on, I'd like to quit. <laughs> but it doesn't happen this time of the year. Yeah, that's that's true. I know from my experience working on a farm, it was uh, when the weather was right, you had to put the time in to, you know, to get the work done. So, um, well, Amanda, I think we're going to take a break right now and we'll, we'll pass it over to Jeb uh, so he can review some of the maps that we have about the farm while we move to a different location on the farm. Does that work for you? That works, Jeff. We'll uh, we'll pass it over to Jeb, and we'll uh, we'll go over some uh, particulars about Mel's farm. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. This is uh, Jeb Messer here. Just going to uh, bear with me uh, one second here. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Okay, uh, Amanda, am I am I visible here? Yes, you you are, Jen. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, this screen here. So so I wanted to uh, give you kind of an idea of, of the aerial view of of the farm that we're we're out visiting today, Mel's farm. So as Jeff and Mel mentioned, um, they they have four different properties that are preserved um, <clears throat> with the trust. So this one here in the center with the black outline, that's the, that's what I, 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 you know, they refer to as kind of the home farm there. That's, that's really where they, where they um, call home. That's where they live. This, this, these are those two buildings you saw in the backdrop there um, where they were, they were filming uh, kind of right in front of them there. So that's the home farm. There's also an additional two farms adjacent to the property farmed by the family. Uh, the buildings are are either uh, either some family members live in or they're or they're rented out, um, and then they own this farm as well down here, which is where uh, Mel mentioned he had some uh, some eggs, uh, some chicken operations. Uh, those are those are housed down here in in this property. So collectively, the the four properties that are preserved make up uh, about 212 acres. They were preserved back in 2007 with the trust. So. Mel's been around for a while. And then actually this property over here across the creek in Lancaster County uh, was just preserved last year. It's not owned by the Nisley family, but um, the, the Nisleys do farm it. So, uh, and Mel was pretty integral in, in, in that project moving forward. You can see the property is, it is uh, pretty close to, to Three Mile Island here. This is just for some reference for folks, this is uh, Three Mile Island. Uh, so they're, they're, they're pretty close to that there. If you zoom out from the properties, so these are those farms I referred to there, the Nisley Farms. There is a fair amount of other protected land in the surrounding area. Uh, these orange properties here, those are farms that are preserved through county government programs. So whether they be Dalton County, uh, Dolphin County has a farmland preservation program, as well as Lancaster County, which we've spoke about um, in length at our in our other webinars. They have a very strong uh, county farmland preservation program. 
so these orange farms are are uh are county county preserved properties um and these purplish and blue ones here those are lancaster farmland trust held easements these other colors they represent some other types of protected lands whether they be other land trust lands or kind of open space properties so it does add to a nice uh kind of block of preserved land um and kind of an added uh note here as of late we mel mentioned his his uh his family in some length here and we've actually had some conversations with some other folks in the in the in the neighborhood about potentially preserving some other farms filling in some of these other blocks that's that's kind of a recent development so we hope that we'll be able to continue building on this contiguous block of preserved preserved land here <clears throat> so the farms are uh, really really good quality soils so um, if you were in some of our previous webinars we do focus we on, on soil quality as as one element of how we score a farm when we're preserving it um, so the green color here those are uh, all class one soils, so kind of cream of the crop soils um, and not far behind it class two soils being the yellow color here so you can see kind of the vast majority of these properties are made up of class one and class two soils and then there are some class three and class four soils which um, in pretty much any other part of pennsylvania are, are really great soils um, but in this area of Southern Dauphin County and Lancaster County, they're, they're class, class three and four. So uh, the trust uh, does you know, have a handful of easements outside of Lancaster County. These are right across the border in Dauphin County, but obviously preserving them really helps towards the effort of uh, directing development to the appropriate places, both in Lancaster and Dauphin County. All right, uh, that was my kind of brief commercial uh, about the farms kind of outside of the um the actual uh video footage there so i'm going to pass it back to jeff i think we're probably ready to go to another location here um so i'm going to pass it uh pass it back to amanda who can share with share jeff okay just give us a second here and we'll get set up and then uh I think we're good there. So Mel, if you want to come around and you'll be able to see yourself on the screen there, we'll just there get you, you positioned. So uh, a couple other questions, but the first question is you have a piece of equipment behind you. Yes. So um, take an opportunity to tell everyone on the call what the equipment is, when it was last used, what does it do for the operation? Yeah, uh, what's behind me here is a chopper. Um, it's actually, uh, I'm not gonna say antiquated, but uh, most farms use self-propelled choppers. Uh, we've continued to use a pool type chopper. We have a combine and do custom combining, but didn't need to buy a self-propelled chopper and get into uh, a lot of custom work with that. So we continue to chop with a pool type chopper. Uh, we use it quite hard here around the farm. Uh, we use it for corn, of course, in the fall. And it was used uh, yesterday already to start chopping. Well, it was used actually two, three weeks ago, ready to chop rye, and then it chopped triticale last week. And um, uh, last evening it was it was chopping alfalfa hay, and we're hoping to finish that here. If this interview goes too long, it may take off from behind me here and you won't see it. <laughs> but uh, we're planning to chop here this afternoon around 1230. So, anyway, it's a, it's a machine that's used a lot, and it's used to chop up uh, the crops for the cows. And then after it's chopped up, it's put on to, we have three, three salad wagons, and uh, we have uh, upright sallows and uh, occasionally we'll use an ag bag but we have enough storage in upright sallows yet so that um, the crop is is 95 98 percent of the time is put into an upright sallow for storage and then fed to the cows throughout the year and the winter etc and uh, mel i know with farmers you know there's always a uh, discussion about whether you like green or red or blue and I see you have a mix of red and green. So is there any particular preference in uh, manufacture of your equipment that you like? Yeah, you ask a loaded question there, Jeff, and I'm not sure I'm not sure if you really wanted to ask that question because you didn't tell me about that one ahead of time. But when I started farming, I grew up on a farm that had Alice Chalmers and became international. When my blood when my blood flows, it flows red. Um, but I have uh, uh, changed brands over the years, not because of uh, thinking that another brand was better, but uh, I'd actually started farming with an Alice Chalmers 
a uh, John Deere 4020 and a uh, 5088 International. So I had one of three different collars and I often joked that I didn't park them on the same barn floor so that they would fight or anything together. And uh, then we moved on to uh, red tractors for a while and then the green tractors came out with an IVT transmission. And so uh, it's been about 15 years ago now that we started purchasing uh, green tractors. So anyway, that's, uh, I could talk about combines because we've had a, an Agco combine and we've had a John Deere combine and most recently a New Holland. So you might say I'm all mixed up and I'll, <laughs> I'll agree with that. And I'm not, uh, you know, the dealer, having a good deal. Probably probably the biggest, uh, advantage. Advantage. Sure. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So you, you like to spread it around and, you know, provide opportunities for, for all the manufacturers out there. So I've done that. Yes. <laughs> uh, so Mel, uh, what's one thing you wish more consumers knew or understood about farming and agriculture? Uh, boy, that's a good question too. I, uh, uh, I think many times people don't understand the amount of work that goes in and the amount of investment that goes in to a farm. And, uh, I've had through through mission trips that I've been on, I've had quite a few occasions to go to Africa, plus a number of other countries. Many times my father was able to join and sometimes I joined him on a trip. But after I come home and realize the many, uh, when, when, when uh, on some of these mission trips, when they hear about our farm, they think, wow, they just can't believe the size and, and the equipment when they see pictures, et cetera. And yet I've also helped, we have uh, what we call an unofficially adopted Kenyan son that I invested in his life back, uh, he's an orphan, that I started investing in back in 2003. And he moved here in 2008 to the US. And he's not here right now, he's living in Reading. But um, he can really tell you that to come here, there is, uh, it's not a cakewalk. There's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of work is into making a business a success, whether it's a farm or any other business. And currently he's driving an 18 wheeler, has his own business, um, but it's been difficult here with COVID-19 because of the freight. So um, yeah, there's a lot of investment, a lot of time. And, and when I relate to these friends from Africa, they oftentimes don't realize the kind of work that goes in to make a farm a success. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what do you believe is the single largest challenge for agriculture in today's environment? Yeah, it's um, probably, certainly farms have needed to specialize more than what they've done years ago. Um, although my dad often said, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And, you know, I'm thankful that we do have diversification here in our farm, but I do see that uh, in the 30 plus years that I've been farming, that that it has become more specialized and bigger, the size of the operations to be able to, uh, and I think finding good markets and being able to manage that market uh, is probably a key, you know, because without a good market, you can do a lot of work and you can market a lot of product, but if you're not making any money, it's really a liability. It's not a business. Sure, so probably markets would be one of the big things. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And then, um, so we mentioned that your farms are preserved, uh, preserved, and I think Jeb mentioned back in 2007. So tell us what led you to preserve your farms and, and why was it important from your perspective to protect this land? Yeah, I um, uh, I value seeing open farmland, and uh, as I was looking at doing it here, uh, I guess that's about 13 years ago. I was looking at possibly doing it through our local county agency here. But the reason I chose Lancaster Farmland Trust was because it was a private organization, and I uh, have really appreciated the values of what they're doing, and they were interested in ground that I call on the other side of the tracks even though they're mostly located in Lancaster. And I heard that uh, Jeb here said that this is in Dauphin County. The Southern border of our farms here is the Conewaga Creek. So we're just across the line. So uh, the other thing my dad often said growing up, uh, the home farm is actually a little closer to the creek than where I am right now. But he said, you could often look out the window and see the promised land on the other side of the creek. So 
I don't know that I subscribe to that, but it's uh, uh, Lancaster is a breadbasket, and I hate to see all the ground being being covered up with buildings and pavement. I uh, even since I did electrical work, uh, oh, that's over 20 years, about 20 years ago, I guess. Uh, there's just when I drive to various businesses where we get materials, it's just a it's just appalling to see the amount of development that covered over what what was open ground what I didn't think was, you know, too many years ago. Yeah. Well, so. we're, we're certainly thankful at the trust that I know our, you know, the community and our supporters are really uh, thankful for the commitment that you and your family made to protect, you know, the four farms that you have here. And, and we often say that the farmers are the real champions of farmland preservation because they, they're the ones that make it happen. You know, they make that commitment to keep their land protected in perpetuity, which is a big commitment to make. And, and we're certainly thankful that, that, now, 13 years ago, which didn't seem like it was that long ago that you made that, you know, that you and your family made that decision. Yep. Um, so, Amanda, I think uh, we'll open it up for questions from the audience, if that's OK to do at this time. That sounds great, Jeff. Thanks, Mel. That was that was really fantastic. It was it's it's interesting to hear from you and hear about your farm operation and why you decided to preserve and. We appreciate your time. I do have a, a few questions from our audience. And if you do have a question at this time, I think what we're going to do is typically we'd open it up um, and allow you to ask your question audibly. But because we have so many people on the line, which there's is a great problem for us to have, um, if you'd like to chat, uh, type it in the chat box, I can read it for you. So the first one we have for you, Mel, here is uh, we've heard that dairy farmers are under considerable pressure because of dropping prices. What effect has the COVID-19 virus had on the demand and prices for dairy products? And that's from Harvey Abrams. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, a number of times throughout the interview here, I talked about markets, uh, not only milk, but also eggs. But this particular question has to do with milk. We have needed, my son has needed to dump some milk. Um, one of the advantages, and it hasn't carried the, it hasn't carried totally all of it, but our daughter-in-law, which uh, is married to our oldest son and has the cows, has a, a cheese business. And she's actually taken advantage of some of this milk that would be thrown away and making cheese out of it and then selling it. She has a shed here on the one farm where she sells cheese as Jubilee. I can do an advertisement for her. It's Jubilee Heritage Cheese, I think. I think there's even a website. Anyway, there's had a, there's had we've had a milk and just recently uh, being asked to cut our production to 85 percent of what March's production was and then everything over that is going to be paid a price that's far less than production so there's not an incentive to produce over 85 percent of what we were producing in March I say we my son and his wife manage the cows and we do share the milk check so one of the ways that I've helped with COVID-19 is change the percentage of the milk checks when the, when the price drops too low. So that's one of the advantages of being dad, I guess, and being seasonal or being a seasoned farmer. Wonderful, wonderful. Next question for you uh, from Dave Hendel. Um, he, he says that you mentioned that the crops are stored in a silo. So how do you prevent spoilage and mildew? Okay, yes, that's a very good question. There's two types of silos that we have here in the farm and you can't see it from, at least from this vantage point. We have what's called a, uh, an open air concrete silo. Uh, they're all vertical. And uh, when you put the material in there, it compresses and becomes airtight in the bottom or basically airtight in the bottom. And then you have a silo loader that takes off the top. And if you would quit taking the silage off the top, it would mold. You have to take three to four inches off every day to keep ahead of the mold cycle. So that's one type of silo. And we have two of those here in the farm. And then we have three of them that are oxygen limiting, where we put it in and there's an unloader at the bottom. And then you close it up and it's oxygen tight. And you still get a little bit of mold on the top layer, but it's very, very limited because of the oxygen limiting structure. So there's two different types. And then the other way of storing it is in an ag bag, which is basically just a big plastic bag, heavy duty. And you have a machine that, that, that compresses it into that bag and then you seal it just like an oxygen limiting sallow. 
And then when you start feeding out of it, you have to use so many inches off a day or it just like a silo, it would start molding on that face. Really interesting. Thanks for that explanation. Okay, uh, another question from Dave. How do you reduce milk production? Yeah, that'd be a better question for my son, but I can, he actually just sent me a text here before this interview. And uh, one of the ways that they're gonna do it is call cows that would be pretty far out or aren't bred back or low production. In other words, reduce the number of cows you have, beef cows, you have to call them or send them to beef uh, market. Uh, another way is to, uh, he's looking at putting another group of cows in and feeding them a little bit less uh, uh, costly concentrate. In fact, just last week, he put another bin up here in the farm that we haven't had since we purchased it. And the reason being is so that he can have one more bin to put some less costly concentrate in to feed for lower production. So basically, Normally you try to feed for the best production you can for the cost. And in this case, there's a number of ways in it. And it's so, it's kind of counterproductive to what we're normally used to doing. And it's really not um, a cut and dried way to do it. You know, there, there's various ways they're looking at it, but uh, we're still too early in the process to see what'll happen, you know, how it's gonna respond, how they're gonna respond. Great. Thank you. So how long do you see yourself farming, Mel? We have some questions here today. I, uh, I'm 62 and I think it talks about retirement, maybe one place in the Bible. And I tell people that I retire every evening, but then I get back up the next day and get at it. Um, I've said that um, as long as I have health, I don't know that I have a retirement age. I do expect, um, I'm not sure how many years here to, to turn the real estate, et cetera, over to the next generation. But at this point, uh, I enjoy what I'm doing every day. I just say, I don't have to do quite as much as I used to in my younger years. So that's not always easy to attain when the work's out there to do, but uh, uh, I enjoy what I'm doing to the point that uh, my father said, and, and he's 89, he worked for me in the, uh, chicken house till he was 87 I had a retirement party for him now he didn't own the chickens anymore but he worked as an egg packer and he said he'd much sooner wear out than rust out and I probably agree with that if I have my health that I'd sooner wear out than rust out wonderful okay and I have uh, one more question and uh, Jeff might have to step in and um and help with an answer to this one, Joellen Walmer uh, asked, is protected land absolutely safe from zoning changes? Um, so certainly, yeah, I, I'll take that question. Um, so when a, when, a, when a farm is permanently preserved, there's a deed restriction that gets attached um, to the title of the property. And then that deed restriction carries with the title. So in in Mel's case here, you know, in the coming years, when he decides to transfer ownership of the land to his his uh, children, you know, those farms will still be preserved because that easement carries with the the title to the land. The zoning ordinance in the particular municipality can change. Uh, you know, the in this particular township, they could decide that they're going to rezone. Mel's farms all to you know residential or industrial land um, that commonly doesn't happen especially when townships know that farms are permanently preserved but even if the zoning changes that easement will take precedent over the zoning designation so even if it is zoned residential you know the particular landowner still cannot develop that farm uh, for for what the zoning may permit the easement is going to override that zoning designation. Great, thanks, Jeff. All right, so it looks like uh, I have one more question for you, Mel. Um, what do you think farming looks like uh, in the region, in the area, in say a couple of decades? Boy, uh, that uh, 
uh, I've seen a lot of changes in the 30 years that I've been farming uh, in, in a number of ways. And I'm, probably that comment has as much to do with the poultry as anything. Uh, back when we get started, uh, shortly after I got married, we put up one laying house. And back then in the 80s, that was pretty common to put up a independent commercial caged layer house. And then you sold the eggs to various markets. But uh, in 15 to 18 years after that, they started on inline grading. And so it started to make the independent uh, uh, commercial cage laying operations become less and less efficient because the eggs have to be taken somewhere to process them. And that's really the, the, what we've fallen into because we've never processed our own eggs. And so unless our operation would turn into a niche market like cage free or brown eggs or some type of market that you're not doing inline grading, um, I do see that it, there's a limited amount of, of this type of operation being put up now. So what it's gonna look like in a couple decades, well, I don't know that I can answer that question. Uh, you know, I told, uh, I think it was Laura here that if I have a question I can't answer, I'll just kind of step around it, you know, and I, I did that a little bit with the retirement question. I didn't give you an exact age. I just kind of told you a little bit what retirement looks like to me, but uh, yeah, concerning what it looks like in a couple decades, I hope there's room for the family farm because I continue to see the value uh, in, in small operations being, being out there. When I say small, many people don't look at our operation as small. And in, and in the 80s, it wasn't as big as what it is now, but in the 80s, a poultry operation looked bigger than what it does in, in 2020. So uh, what it's gonna look like down the road, I hope that there's room for family farms like ours that it's not just big, uh, you know, large companies that uh, that have lots of employees but less owners. You know, business business ownership. When I had the electrical business, um, whenever I had an employee that left to start his own business or do something, I wanted to encourage him because I am independent, business minded, and I didn't want to discourage someone from doing a business on their own. And so, uh, yeah, that's. Hopefully that answers it to some extent. I I certainly don't have a crystal ball and I don't believe in the crystal ball. And uh, so anyway, I uh, yeah, hopefully that gives you a, a perspective of what I hope to see that our children can continue to farm and even grandchildren, you know, in, in if that's a lifestyle they enjoy. But um, the important thing is to pursue the dream that you feel God puts in your heart. Uh, Cause there's many people, even when I get started, um, I heard the comment, well, I would have liked to farm, but I couldn't do this or this or this. And, you know, you have to pursue that dream and, and trust the doors will open because it does look monumental when you get started. It looked the same way back in 1980 is what it does now. I mean, now we're talking millions for farms. Back then it was, you know, a couple hundred thousand. And uh, the farmer standing on here right now, I had a fairly high debt load when, when I purchased this farm and my loan agent actually told me that I shouldn't go over a certain price. And I went about 15,000 over that. And I won't tell you the whole story, but I'd be kicking myself to this day if I wouldn't have purchased this farm. And uh, so you have to be willing to step out of the comfort zone sometimes without being foolish, I guess. Hmm. Good thoughts, good thoughts. And we, we appreciate what you're doing out there. And we appreciate that you're you know passing that tradition down um, through through generations as well. So we're hopeful in, in decades that farming will still be as strong as it is now. Um, now, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, despite COVID and despite everything going on in the world, that the cows still need to be milked and um, the farmers are still planting, planting the fields and, and out there doing the work that they typically do. And so this question um, is one last one I think we'll take here, um, again from Dave Hendel, and his question is about the eggs and the milk. He asked, are your eggs and milk sold and consumed locally? I, the, I would say the milk would be probably more local than the eggs, although the eggs are processed in, in uh, Pennsylvania. So uh, I'm guessing most of our egg products would go, you know, New York City, uh, you know, Baltimore, uh, Newark, New Jersey, and, and big city areas, you know, in this area, if that's considered locally, uh, our eggs 
the products actually go to Michael Foods, which is an egg breaker. So our eggs are not in shell, they're sold as liquid eggs. And so they would go to things like uh, processing plants and places that buy tankers of, of liquid eggs. Uh, as far as the milk, our milk is sold through a local co-op, which is part of a bigger co-op. And uh, they certainly are glad when they can deliver it to local plants. We have a co-op meeting once a year that I usually attend. And um, uh, for transportation of the milk and the cost of the, to the, all the pool farmers, it's ideal to be able to process it as close as possible so it doesn't need, you know, hauled up to Massachusetts or somewhere. And most of the places I think are within a, uh, I'm going to say, 100 mile radius of the farm. So, uh, so that's uh, kind of uh, the nuts and bolts of where most of our products go. As far as the corn and uh, soybeans, soybeans actually, most of them go to a plant just down 441 here made into soybean meal for uh, uh, for, for feed, for uh, cattle feed, and uh, as far as corn, most of it goes to a local feed mill here within 10 to 15 miles of the farm also. Great, good. Well, Mel, thank you so much for your time today. This has just really been fantastic, and I know um, some of the questions you had ahead of time, but others you didn't, and uh, you did a really great job of answering them. And we're incredibly grateful for uh, for the work that you do out there um, on your farm, and, and glad that you were able to uh, to join us on this beautiful day. Yeah, well, thank you. I hope it uh, filled the gap of what you're looking for, and uh, I was glad I was able to do it. Wonderful. And I'll just say to uh, to everybody that's out there watching, we're glad that you could join us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, to do these um, webinar opportunities. Next week, we're doing having a farmer panel. It's called Ask Me Anything. We're going to have a, um, a handful of different farmers available to answer your questions and talk a little bit about their experiences, just as Mel um, has done for us today. I will say, you know, the reason that um, we Lancaster Farmland Trust can continue to provide resources to farmers and um, and work with farmers like Mel to, to permanently protect their land um, is because of you. You are the reason for our success. Um, the commitment of our landowners and the support of our community um, is is why we continue um, can continue to do what we do. So if if you are able to uh, make a contribution to Lancaster Farmland Trust, we would love if you would consider that. Um, that's how we we keep pushing through. Um, this recording will be available online after uh, the webinar, and so you'll receive an email if you want to go back and uh, hear Mel answer a question again, or just uh, to watch the presentation again. And um, and we hope we can uh, uh, see you um, next week on Wednesday for our uh, Ask Me Anything Farmer panel. So thank you for joining us. Thanks again to you, Mel. Um, appreciate your time, and uh, and have a good week, everyone. I'll say in closing, I appreciate that there's organizations such as Lancaster Farmland Trust for me to connect with to do what I wanted to do here for the for the farm. So thanks for what you do and keep it up. Thanks, Mel. Take care, everyone. Have a good day.